Welcome everyone to the webinar, Can Pianists Teach Jazz? And I'm delighted to see you and I'm delighted to say that uh, nearly 550 teachers signed up to find out the answer to this question, which I'm here to tell you is absolutely most definitively yes. The answer is yes. Uh, classical pianists can teach jazz. So I'm hoping to convince you of that today by telling you all about my personal experiences of embracing jazz and uh, getting comfortable with it um, since the, just since the beginning of this year actually uh, and we're going to I'm going to show you my interviews with two living legends of jazz education and that's Jeremy Siskind and Elisa Milne. Um, now my conversations with both of them were quite lengthy they went for almost an hour each. So I'm not gonna show all of those today. I'm gonna to just show you the main segments today, but um, Beth and I have decided to put those full interviews up on YouTube so that you can watch them in their entirety. And we will send you the links to those in the follow-up email. And I highly recommend watching them. It's, it, they're absolutely fascinating. So two housekeeping things. Number one, today's webinar will run for just over an hour. Well, about an hour 15 probably. And um, uh, the goal of it is that if you've ever felt uncomfortable when your students say, I want to teach a bit of jazz, today is going to make you feel so much more comfortable. Uh, the second thing is there might be a little bit of background noise. I don't know if you can hear this, but there's an airplane going over right now. Um, I live under a flight path. Some days I get lucky, some days I don't. Unfortunately, today the planes are going directly overhead. Um, so enjoy. And the third thing is um, that next door is renovating. So we might hear some banging of nails as well. How, how joyful. Hopefully we'll be able to cover it up with, um, with some good jazz. Now, when you all signed up for this webinar, you um, uh, answered some questions about your experience with jazz. And the lovely Beth, the wonderful Beth, who is always here to help me, which I'm so grateful for, has compiled this into some very interesting stats. So over to Beth to tell us. Awesome. So uh, have you played much jazz yourself? 18.4 said none at all. And 77.1% fall into the same camp, I think, as I do. 77% and a lot, four and a half. Um, the next question that we had, um, do you incorporate improvisation into your lessons? 18.4 uh, said not at all. 68% said sometimes and 13, almost 14% said very much so. We've got some real jazz heroes. Um, are you familiar with the music of uh, that of Elisa Milne or Christopher Norton? And uh, never heard of it, 17%. You all are in for a treat. A little familiar, 48.8. .8, and I teach that stuff all the time, 33.6. And then our final question, and really the heart of it right here, how do you feel about teaching jazz? 22% said very uncomfortable, 10% said it comes naturally, and 676 .6 said that they are interested, they're still neutral. So, oh, back to you, Sam. Thank you, Beth, that was incredibly informative. Now, um. Basically, the major this means that the majority of you, uh, just like I was, and, and like in that, the big yellow pieces of pie, uh, neutral or done it a little bit. And in fact, a lot of the time I was probably in the blue pieces of pie where, no, I'm very uncomfortable or I've never done it at all. Um, and um, uh, that's because my background is incredibly traditional, purely classical. Um, some of you who may have attended my previous webinars will know about me that uh, until just a few years ago, I never played anything that I had not read off a page. I was a very diligent young pianist. I went through all my AMEB grades on piano and did my diplomas and did my performances and practiced, but it was all very, very traditional. So um, um, I always envied jazz pianists though. I listened to jazz pianists and I wished that I could play like that. And um, I just assumed that I couldn't. But everything changed for me at the beginning of this year when I enrolled in Jeremy Siskin's jazz course. So I became an international student at Fullerton College, California, and there were online classes. And I attended one tutorial and one lecture a week that Jeremy gave. And 
um, it was the beginner jazz course. Now you had to have a certain um, piano playing ability to join. It wasn't beginner piano lessons, but it was beginner jazz. And um, I, um, despite it being a beginner course, I learned uh, so much. It was quite challenging. And then as of uh, August uh, this year, I am now enrolled in the advanced course. Now, um, I first saw Jeremy teach jazz when I went to MTNA in 2019 and he gave a session called Five Things Every Piano Teacher Should Know About Jazz But Is Afraid to Ask. And I learned so much from just that one hour session that I was, this is why I was so excited at the thought of having Jeremy as my teacher for a whole semester. But what I did not expect was that I would be able to implement everything that I was learning straight away with my own students. And this is what gave me the idea for this webinar today because it really has changed uh, ev everything for me. It's changed everything that I do. I could, I could hardly believe that this was part of my teaching now. Okay, so Jeremy has a wealth of information to offer and I'm gonna show you the main segments today because um, not only did he kindly agree to chat with me, he was very, very generous with his time. Um, so here is the first part of the interview where he talks us through his own beginnings in jazz and his views on the huge role of community and mentorship when learning jazz. Hello, Jeremy, and thank you so much for joining me today and for having this conversation. It is my pleasure to be here. Yay, excellent. Okay, so we're gonna start with, can you just tell us your early experience of piano? Sure, so I got unbelievably lucky on a number of fronts. Um, we happen to have a piano in my house. My parents signed me up for the very closest music school. I don't think they did any research, but there happened to be a music school down the street and it happened to be a Yamaha music school. And as I later found out, not only was it a Yamaha music school, but it was what's known in Yamaha as the corporate Yamaha music school. Um, in the US at any one time, Yamaha selects one of their schools to basically be their testing ground and they manage it from the corporate level rather than locally. And so, at the corporate Yamaha, they tend to have the most resources, the best teachers, they're piloting new programs, they're giving students opportunity. So as about a four-year-old, I got signed up for group lessons at Yamaha. I loved it. My brother hated it. And because my brother hated it, I loved it even more. And <laughs> Sam, I know that you know a lot about the Yamaha method, but Yamaha te teaches students things like improvisation, keyboard harmony, composition, really from such young ages. And as a jazz person, I've never found it to be a barrier to improvise. In fact, it's more of a barrier to me to read notes on a page. And I think that partially speaks to the Yamaha method and my experience there, singing solfege, learning about what notes kind of go together, just inventing with my teacher who was really excellent. At the same time, I think there was something unique about me that and I think it's still true that I'm kind of restless and I don't like doing the same thing multiple times. And so I definitely have my teacher frustrated with me that I wouldn't play the Kabalevsky piece or you know whatever it was exactly as written that I always had to trail off at the end and add a few more measures or I always had to extend something or choose a more colorful note somewhere in the development. So I think there was just something about me that was drawn towards creativity and improvisation from the beginning. When I was about 11 or 12, my fantastic teacher had this realization or, or had this plan, I should say, um, and said in not so many words, wow, this kid has a really amazing ear and pretty bad technique. He should be a jazz pianist. <laughs> of course, that's, that's, that's partially joking and it's very reductive, but there's also an element um, when you have that really great ear and you're drawn towards improvisation, she had an amazing instinct. And she knew that I was not going to be a concert pianist. Can I just ask, and, is this the teacher yeah. in, in the Yamaha system? Is, this is, yes. so you, you remained in the Yamaha system from four years old. This is and now you're still in class, this is 11 years old. Were you Absolutely. just doing the group lessons at that point or were you also doing private lessons at that point? I was doing both group and private and starting probably about a seven or eight years old, I was doing both. And mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to be in a junior special advanced course class um, which was really just a fantastic 
opportunity uh, where it was really high level students across the board, um, including one of my colleagues in that class ended up going to the Curtis Institute and is now doing a lot of composing for orchestras and really kind of incredible stuff. So I had really great colleagues at Yamaha. And did you ever go so, to Japan? Yeah. Did you ever compose? I did, yeah. I, I got to go to Japan as part of the, the junior original concert, the JOC program twice, yeah. which is, it was so life-changing for me to participate in that program every year. If you guys don't know about that JOC program, maybe it's popular in Australia. Um, yeah. They, they kind of insist it's not a competition, and yet people are, are advanced towards the local level, the national level, and the international level. They write one piece per year, could be kind of any style, any instrumentation. And if you get to these upper levels, they hire professional instrumentalists to play with you. So I got to play with these professional drummers and bass players and horn players, and it just really changed my world to be writing music and having it performed on that level. Um, could I just circle back to your comment that you, someone labeled you as fantastic ear, bad technique, better should be a jazz pianist. Um, I, I'm, I'm often in awe of the technique of jazz pianists mm. and you have an, an, what I consider to be amazing technique. Um, so uh, what's, what's the definition of a bad technique versus a good technique? Well, 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 thank you. And it's worth saying that um, my technique completely transformed. I decided to get serious about piano when I was about 15 or 16. And I knew that that was my absolute weakest link. Um, I knew that I could coast on my ear and that's what I had been doing for a really long time. So starting, I think it was one of the summers um, between years in high school when I was about 14 or 15, I decided to spend three hours a day just on technique. And I don't consider, you know, compared to a classical pianist, I don't think I have, you know, amazing technique. I can't play the Chopin etudes the way that a great classical pianist could, or even a good classical pianist could. Um, but I get around the piano much better now and, and can say most of what I want to say. And when you're 14 or 15, you decided, I really got to get this done. I, and, yeah. and so then you, you firmed up your, your technique, but then you must have also been playing a lot of jazz at the time. Yeah. Um, starting in high school, I had a really great community. And this is one of the, the things where I think classical learning is essentially different than jazz, that jazz almost has to be done in a community. Um, I don't see a lot of successful jazz musicians, especially younger jazz musicians um, who really graduate to the next level in terms of just being a confident improviser and member of a band who don't play with others on a regular basis. So um, I happened to go to a public high school, but it had a really nice jazz program. And I met three or four other musicians who, um, who were as into and interested in jazz and uh, proficient at jazz as I was. And we formed bands and we would play all the time. And so, yes, I was practicing jazz and I had this jazz teacher and jazz assignments and I was getting the chance to play it. Um, and just logging that time on your instrument is so essential. And maybe I'm going on a digression here. Um, Sam, you've been in my class, so you've heard me repeatedly compare jazz to learning a language. Um, and I think from a teacher, you can learn the elements, you can learn the grammar, you can learn the pronunciation, you can learn all those basic elements, but to really learn to speak, you have to be doing it, right? You have to be immersed, having conversations, coming up with things off the cuff. And that's so true about jazz too. We have to log those hours playing. It could be by ourselves, but it's so much more interesting and inspiring to do it with others as well. Jazz musicians learn through mentorship. Um, and in the modern day, this can take some other forms. It can be that you are mentored through listening, you know, on a, listening to albums, right? That can be part of your community um, and part of your mentorship experience. But to do that in isolation with a score, to, to try to learn jazz in isolation with a score really um, is, is kind of missing the point. So wasn't that absolutely fascinating? Um, now, for those of us who are trained Yamaha teachers, we know the exact course that Jeremy was doing as a, as a child. And we also know that very few of them went on to be amazing jazz pianists like Jeremy Siskind. Um, so it was it was that incredible oral training plus the insight of his teacher who who exposed him to jazz plus the amazing community uh, in his own high school that set him on the path to being this incredible jazz pianist. Um, so when I compare my pianistic upbringing to Jeremy's, 
Really, the only similarity was that we both logged time on the instrument. It's just that we logged our time in different ways. Um, and so hear, hearing Jeremy talk about community and mentorship and the importance of those things made me realize that uh, that's our responsibility as studio teachers to do that as much as we can, even if we are classical studio teachers. We can teach our students how to read a lead sheet, how to read a chord chart, and I'll give you some resources for being able to do that later on. Um, and we can encourage them to join a band, we can encourage them to even accompany the church choir and give them skills to be able to do that. Um, another wonderful friend of mine, Leela Viss, has a course called How to Play Piano in a Band. And I think we should all encourage our students to go and have a look at that course. And as teachers, I, I really highly recommend it. It's a wonderful course and don't worry, we'll send you a link to that as well. Okay, now in the next part of the interview with Jeremy, um, we talked about his book, Jazz Piano Fundamentals. Now this was my set text for the course that Jeremy wrote. Uh, it is the most amazing book. I can't hold up a copy because I've only got it digitally. Um, but if you're interested in learning how to play and teach jazz, there is no doubt, this is the text to get. But I did ask Jeremy to um, go through what he thinks are the absolute fundamentals of teaching jazz. The first thing that I would really want for any student is for them to experience jazz. Um, you were, uh, I would say that, you know, we talked about community being important, uh, more important in jazz learning than classical learning. Another thing that's way different between the two is that jazz is truly an oral art form and we're not kidding around when we say that. <laughs> so any experience of jazz music that doesn't include some listening is really incomplete and probably like a little bit off the mark. Um, in my book, to that end, I include guided listenings for each unit and I try to tie them into something that we learned in that unit. So again, if we go back to the language metaphor, if you've never heard French, right? If you've never heard anybody speak French, it's gonna be pretty hard for you to dive in and have a decent French accent. So the first thing that I would do with any student, and this is whether they're playing a notated jazz piece or whether you're working on specifically jazz improvisation would probably be to play something for them. And ideally to guide them, them through it. You're free to use my guided listings from Jazz Piano Fundamentals. The very first one is Freddie Freeloader from the iconic Miles Davis album, Kind of Blue. Of course, there's no rule that says you have to start with that piece. There's a million great jazz tracks that you could start with. Um, and then probably the rhythm, and you, you mentioned swing rhythm um, is really at the core of what we need to know about jazz. I think so often we get really bogged down with scales and arpeggios and modes and all of this stuff. And of course, that, that's out there, that's real. Um, but yeah, from my presentation, I mentioned that swing rhythm, the big misconception is that it's about timing. It's about um, this dot, 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 dot. But it's actually articulation that defines swing rhythm. And we need to really understand that articulation, which we can do both intellectually, but probably ultimately, we need to do it orally as well in order to really understand swing rhythm. So I think a lot of the beginning of the book has to do with understanding swing um, and how to practice it, how to use uh, mnemonic syllables to explain it or to, to simulate it with your voice um, and then how to listen for it in, in, in tracks. What does the drums do? What do the bass do? And then what ultimately is the role of each instrument as you play a jazz standard? So I absolutely loved that explanation. So just to revise Jeremy's three things that the absolute fundamentals, number one, community, playing with others, so important. Number two, the fact that jazz is an oral art form and without listening, we're not really going to get the right feel for it. And I know that when, even when I'm asking my students to play some of Christopher Norton's music or Elisa Mill's music, which we're gonna talk about later on, I know that if they haven't ever listened to jazz, it just doesn't come out right. Um, and, um, and then the third thing is, um, oh, and with the listening recommendations that Jeremy mentioned. So uh, in the full interview, I asked him to give us some recommendations that would be suitable for slightly younger students because Freddie Freeloader can be like quite confronting as your first experience of jazz. And so Jeremy goes through a whole heap of them and I encourage you to listen to that and then go and look them up on Spotify and see what appeals to your students. 
Um, and also I have put together a playlist of uh, songs that are in a 12 bar blues that are kind of relatable to, uh, to our students, to their generation. And um, we're gonna be sending you a link to that Spotify playlist as well. So you can have that. Um, and the third thing was rhythm, particularly swing that Jeremy said, like swing is, is getting that right is really is such a fundamental part of jazz. And um, in, in Jeremy's session at MTNA, when he explained how, how what swing is really all about, I realized that I had been teaching it all wrong. So Jeremy explains that more in depth in the next part of the interview, which starts off with a discussion between the difference between jazz piano fundamentals that he's written and the other book that he's written called Playing Solo Jazz Piano. So you've written Jazz Piano Fundamentals and then you've also written Playing Solo Jazz Piano. Do you want to show us that one? Show us that cover. Absolutely. Ta-da. Yay. Now, what's the difference between these publications? Right. Yeah, so um, Jazz Piano Fundamentals is basically for somebody, maybe somewhat like you, Sam, who has a strong or somewhat strong classical piano background and has pretty limited experience with playing jazz, reading a lead sheet, and really needs those fundamentals. So I label the book as for basically months one through six of private lesson study. So if somebody came to me, Sam, if you came to me and wanted private lessons, we would go over one of those. Uh, there's 12 units. We'd go over one every two weeks. And by the end of it, you'd be pretty capable of playing in a jazz group. Um, playing solo jazz piano is less instructional. It's not taking you from point A to point Z. It's um, kind of a categorization of how somebody who already has some jazz experience can approach playing solo jazz piano, which of course is a different art form. Um, so it has chapters that go over things like stride piano, ballad playing, sharing voicings between the hands, how to play a bass line and, and a melody at the same time and things like this. And it doesn't necessarily tell you exactly how to do it, but it shares what are a bunch of different strategies that jazz pianists use to play solo jazz piano, um, which to my knowledge and to the knowledge of most people that I, to, who I talk to who are enjoying the book, hasn't really been done anywhere before. So um, I wouldn't really pick up playing solo jazz piano unless you already play some amount of jazz, um, but jazz piano fundamentals is for somebody like a piano teacher who, who doesn't have jazz experience. Okay, that is good to know. And both of those books are supported by your awesome YouTube channel, which Yo. is amazing. How many subscribers do you have now? I'm, I'm approaching 6,500, I think. That is fantastic. And so and there are little QR codes like that you scan throughout the book that take you to the YouTube channel where you are just explaining that concept uh, in video format or extend, you're extending it further than the book. Is it is it meant to be... A, like a complimentary resource to the books? Yeah, exactly. I would say it, it's complimentary. So it's just in Jazz Piano Fundamentals. I have the QR codes. Right. And I wanted to make sure I had somewhere where I was playing all of the examples so that you could hear, you know, especially as we're talking about things like swing feel, you could hear how I would play them. And then I do explain, and sometimes I'll get an idea as I'm explaining and go a little bit sideways from the book, um, or I'll just reinforce by, by explaining the same concepts in the book in a different way. Um, and the book also has links to all the tracks for the guided listening. Um, and in the, as you scan the QR codes, there's some written practice in jazz piano fundamentals and all the correct answers mm. uh, to what degree there are correct answers are, are in there as well. Ah, oh, brilliant. Actually, could you just give us a quick demonstration now of swing as it, as it coming out wrong? Like when it's uh, the way classical teachers will approach it, like the purely rhythmic and not articulation, and then the same play the same thing with uh, swing sounding right. So typically people who are inexperienced in jazz will play a scale or something like that, like this. And technically based on that little icon that you see in the corner of any swing piece that's notated of two eighths equals triplet eighth, you know, uh, technically that's correct. But the rhythm isn't emphasizing the syncopation, right? Um, so what we generally want to do is we want to put a little bit more weight on that offbeat eighth note, especially just to counteract the fact that now this onbeat eighth note is twice as long. So we want to go. And you can hear that the rhythm is kind of immediately transformed. 
by that difference in articulation. But let me show you at fast tempos, we don't swing eighth notes in the rhythmic sense at all. So this is an Oscar Peterson solo I'm gonna play for you. Right? Um, and yet, when we add accents, we can still imply a swing feel. And it's partially the accents, it's partially the shape of the line, which will emphasize the offbeats. But let me play it for you with no accents first. So I'm gonna do my best to play it exactly evenly. Okay, it sounds okay. But as I add accents, now all of a sudden it pops to life, it becomes three dimensional, we can tell that it's in a swing feel. Um, and you can think of just about any jazz line as, you know, if you can't play it as a drum solo and it would be interesting, then it's probably not really rhythmically worthwhile. Right? So if it's deca 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 that's not interesting. If it's ba ba do ba do ba dum da ba do ba ba do ba do ba do ba do ba do ba do Right? If there's those accents in there, that's what really gives the rhythm its life in terms of really feeling like swing instead of just simulating swing through some some eighth eighth note little trick. That's wonderful. Thank you. And so now if, if a lot of the teachers watching this are going to be teaching students who are nowhere near capable of playing anything like that Oscar Peterson thing. So <laughs> what would you give as a first exercise to try and play swing uh, in, in a swing feel? Yeah, so I, a five finger pattern is a great to start, a great place to start, excuse me. So, you know. that you can remind them that it would be I'm starting on C it would be the D and the F that are always getting the emphasis and it's hard to do it's actually counts for when you when you've learned classical piano it actually is quite counterintuitive to do that and um, it takes practice definitely so, and then how would you spice that up with putting like an, a nice sounding chord in the left hand just so that it sounds more jazzy to them when they're doing it at home? Like let's say if you've got a 12 year old who says, I want to play some jazz. Sure. Yeah. I, I would probably start with like a C major six. So a C major triad with an A on top. So nice. It's got a little bit more, more spice in there than your average triad. be a nice little place to start yeah and then all the mums and dads of, of these students at home are going to go oh you sound good and <laughs> uh, and that's all they're playing um so that is really cool that was awesome um wasn't it just to learn about that and so put your hand up if you already knew that about swing that it's not just about rhythm it's about articulation it has to be do vadu 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 like that um and it is quite hard to do now this got me thinking in my studio about a little piece that I've written in my rote repertoire series called Chameleon and it's based on a scale pattern and it's, it, it drills a pentascale as well as a whole scale and I thought this would be useful for a jazz exercise so I'm going to show this to you now and we can just go through it together. So this is Chameleon level one. So playing this in a perfectly classical sense we've got the right hand just a C pentascale and full scale. chameleon is because it's going to get transposed later on so here's um the here is the um com here's level two so what happens in you, you've spotted the difference they've learned level one you can teach it by rote if you like and now in level two students will see that now the left hand is in minims or half notes so this gets the coordination going <laughs> played the uh, second line for you and then if we go to level three you can see now that the left hand is moving up and down in a pentascale and the right hand is just doing the same thing again so if you want to play along let's do line just let's just do the second line
Okay, so the, uh, the reason it's called chameleon, just the way a chameleon changes the colors on its skin, we are going to change this by playing it in a different key. It works in any major key, minor key, mode, whatever you like. So, and it, it works if whatever the fingering is. The left hand stays in the pentascale and the right hand just plays the scale. So for example, in E flat major, I'm gonna do E flat major fingering with my right hand, but my left hand will just be in a five finger position. and so on. Okay, now the reason why I've brought this up is because I've been using this to teach swing rhythm to my students. So the idea is we have to play it legato and we have to play it accenting every second note pretty much, um, but the uh, we're going to play it not just... See, that's swing done wrong uh, because we're accenting the long note values. So we have to play it like this. It's actually quite hard to do. If you want to try it with me now, we're going to play Chameleon level three, just the second line in a swing rhythm. And it's hard to do. It really is hard. Okay, now, um, Jeremy mentioned that it's nice to put a sixth chord underneath. It'll make it sound jazzier. And I actually think for my students, it worked really well having that sixth chord in first inversion. So in the left hand, I'm playing E, G, A, and C. And then I'm gonna play the right hand an octave higher. And so now what I'm gonna show you, oh, by the way, this is your bonus. This is your free bonus. I'm gonna show you Jazzy Chameleon. And uh, where is it? Here it is. Okay, so let's just, uh, here's a notated version of Jazzy Chameleon, which is also a bonus in, in the box. In, in the pack, I mean. So um, so we've put the right hand up an octave and now we're just gonna play the left hand in sixth chords and we've got to try and do it in swing. So let's play the second line. One, two, three, four. And now we have Jazzy Chameleon. Okay, so. Um, that is just a cute way to teach it and it can be in any key and then we can work out the sixth chords in the left hand. Um, and so in the chat, Beth is going to put a PDF of Chameleon, which has levels one, two, and three sort of in a screen share version. And then also a PDF of Jazzy Chameleon and you can download those straight away. Now, if you are watching the replay, don't despair because actually there is a coupon code that you can go and get the entire pack and that's for everybody here as well. You can have the entire Chameleon pack for instead of $9.90, you can have it for $2. So in the pack, there's audio uh, files, there's a video demonstration of Jazzy Chameleon, there's video teaching tutorials for all three teaching levels and then also a bonus piece of reverse Chameleon where the, where the left hand has the scale and the right hand has the pentascale. So it's just, it's actually a really, really great way of teaching scales and getting students to transpose. So, uh, so that is, um, that, that's all about the, the bonus, the live bonus for it. Thank you for being here today. Um, now back to Jeremy. So next we discuss the perception or potentially the misperception that uh, the jazz is innate. Um, I know that I just think, I've been often very envious of jazz pianists and I hear them play and I just think that they were born with this amazing activity. However, um, it's not true. So here's what Jeremy has to say on his perspective on innate versus um, learned jazz skills. I think jazz can absolutely be taught and learned. I think the language me learning metaphor is really useful here in that it's hard. <laughs> And you have to really immerse yourself in order to be able to do it. And I see students, well, especially at a piano teacher level, I see a lot of piano teachers thinking, I should be able to do this. I have all this experience with the piano. I should be making such fast progress. But again, if you think of that language learning timeline, you know, if you think, well, I speak English really well, I should be able to speak French. It doesn't quite work like that. You have to really, really put in the time and immerse yourself in order to start becoming fluent. I think it is, like languages, it is easier if you start earlier. 
I think if you start improvising and if you start feeling comfortable with chords from an earlier age, then it is much less intimidating. And it, I think I see some of my, early, my young students picking it up kind of faster. Um, but if the question is, can it be learned? I think absolutely it can be learned. So I don't, you know, it might be difficult, but nobody should assume that it's, it's an impossible task. Okay, hey, so um, that means that, you know, if we can't play jazz, it's just because we didn't start early enough, that's all. But does that mean it's too late? No, it's not too late, absolutely not. Um, it absolutely can be learned. So um, I'm gonna now demonstrate to you what I did um, for a recent little soiree I had with my adult students. Every term we have what I like to call a whip whack. Whip whack stands for work in progress wine and cheese. So at the whip whack, everybody comes along with a piece that they are working on and we have a very low key performance environment. And sometimes they will only play if everybody's chatting over their glass of wine. So um, anyway, at the most recent one, um, I decided I would sort of warm everybody up and play first and play them some cocktail music um, uh, just to relax them all. So I'm going to show you what I did. Now, this is this is me making stuff up. I. This is not something I do. This is not something I've ever, ever done on a webinar before. So I'm going to show you what I played for them. So first I'll break it down for you. So basically all a lot of jazz is based on a 2-5-1 chord progression. So 2-5-1 in C major. But in jazz, we really need to make it like a 2-9, a say D minor 9, and then a G7, and then a C major 7, which sounds really nice. And then, after your D minor 9, when we go to G7, we might like to alter that a little bit. This has changed my life, learning about altered dominance. And I learned all of this in the first semester. And then we can go to C major 7 or even C6. So what I did was I took my inspiration from Eric Satie and I just did something pedal. And I know that when you're playing those three chords in C major, all you have to do is C major stuff in the right hand. So I'll just do this for 30 seconds now. I'll show you what I did. This is something I've never done before. So to me, like I felt very nervous doing that and I thought it sounded maybe just a little bit clunky, but the, my adult students loved it. And then the best part of it was because they said to me, oh, can, can you teach us to do that? And I'm like, yeah, I can actually, yes. And not only that, I know exactly how I would teach it to you because I know how it was taught to me. And this is all, I, I would not never ever have done this before. This all came from one semester with Jeremy. So um, well, don't worry, we'll send you details about how you can sign up for this course. But it's changed so, it's, it's changed so much for me. Now, not only do I feel like I can do it, but I can teach my students how to do it. Um, now, another thing that I've learned from this jazz course is that it's changed the way I listen to jazz. Um, and it's changed the way that I play jazz from notated scores. I found that I have a greater appreciation of articulation and attention to detail. So the next question I asked Jeremy was this. Can learning jazz, does learning jazz make you a better classical pianist? Mm, that's a great question. Of course, I want to say that the answer is yes. And I think there are a lot of skills that you can learn as a jazz pianist that translate into classical music. Of course, you have to be more reliant on your ear as you learn jazz than you do as a classical pianist. Um, you are also playing in ensembles more and you're learning to play with others. Oftentimes I find that jazz musicians have better time and tempo and rhythm than classical pianists do. You're learning to be really intentional or, or about articulation as you experiment with other articulations. Um, there's a lot of two-handed coordination that seems maybe easy when you watch a jazz pianist that's actually quite difficult and could translate into difficult classical music. 
there's all, there are a ton of elements that I think just open you up as a musician. Of course, am I saying that if you want to win the Van Clyburn, you should really <laughs> invest all of your time studying jazz? Probably not, right? Like, <laughs> you're going to need to spend every waking moment practicing your repertoire and, and doing that. But if you want to be a well-rounded musician, if you want to be a better sight reader, if you want to know more about theory and un really understand it, then practicing jazz is a really great and fulfilling way to get there. I loved that answer, didn't you? I just thought that was beautiful. Okay, um, now I've definitely become a better pianist. I actually feel I've definitely become a better pianist and a better theoretical musician since doing this jazz course. So I thoroughly agree with Jeremy. And the final question I asked him is probably the one that's most relevant to all of us today. I asked, what can classical teachers do to bring jazz into their comfort zone? Again, my, my probably first, first and last thing would be really listen. Really listen, really sit down with recordings. I think another tip would be don't try to do too much too fast. Don't assume that because you understand something, you can execute it and you can be creative with it. Slow down and get really deep into the materials. And don't get frustrated if, if you don't you know, master something in the first couple of weeks. So those would be two, two tips to start with. Um, some other tips I'm thinking of from my books. Um, another one is learn rules and then learn to break them, right? Jazz, uh, you know, from an outsider's perspective, people often think, jazz, it's all about freedom. You just kind of do what you feel, man. Um, and of course, we all want to get to that place um, where we are just completely flowing and expressing ourselves through the music. But in our practice, we need something concrete to aim for. So we should learn rules, master exercises, master, um, master passages with discipline, and then figure out, okay, how can I vary this? How can I make it my own? How can I, I break that rule? So those would be a few tips to start. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, it's always great to spend time with you. Okay, so my best tip to add to that is to go and buy Jazz Piano Fundamentals and start working through it. Uh, and then teach whatever you've just learned to your students. And that was what I was doing for the whole first semester. And I just feel like um, that really changed my teaching life. So you've got to spend time getting comfortable with it if you, um, and um, immerse yourself. Now, what if you don't have this time? Or what if you're just not comfortable uh, with the idea of sitting down and improvising? Well. All is not lost because this is where notated jazz music comes into it. And there are 17% of you watching today who uh, haven't actually had much experience with this. So um, it's just wonderful. There are many composers who have written music where it's, it's perfectly jazzy, but it's all fully notated and written down and we can just read it. And I remember the first time I heard Christopher Norton's music, I just thought all my dreams had come true because finally I could sound like a jazz pianist, but all I had to do was use my sight reading skills. Um, so uh, I started incorporating notated jazz music into my teaching um, like probably 30 years ago. It was a breath of fresh air. And then about 22 years ago, I, um, I met Elisa Milne at a conference at Sydney Conservatorium and we had both just entered the publishing world and we had a lot in common and she had just published her series called Pepperbox Music and Elisa is an incredible composer and jazz musician. She's just amazing and I'm honoured to have been able to call her my friend all this time. She's my friend and my colleague so she's my frolic and um, uh, her music really did change my teaching life. So I'm, I'm so lovely that I was able to interview her and it went on for quite a while. So reminder that the full interview is on YouTube. It's incredible and you must listen to it. Now my and Elisa's musical upbringing could not have been more different. Whereas mine was completely traditional and I just had a once a week piano lesson with my Russian piano teacher. Elisa actually grew up on a college campus. She was a faculty kid and she said that it was just completely normal to her to be music making all the time. There was spontaneous music making all the time. Um, she was absolutely marinated in music. She grew up performing as a child and in, in many different styles and it was all completely spontaneous and, and by ear. So it's no wonder that she produced this plethora of music. Now we're gonna pick up 
Um, in the, uh, we haven't got the very, I'm not going to show you the very beginning of the interview with all the hellos where Elisa talks about that background. We're going to pick up where Elisa talks about her formal piano training. So here is what she had to say about her early piano lessons. I wanted to learn the piano so that I could compose music. Like I decided I was going to compose music first. And then it was like, well, how will I achieve this ambition? And I clearly need to learn how to play the piano. So I was a bit cranky because my mum wouldn't let me start having lessons until I was six. And I was like, I've got to get cracking here. Like you can't be, you can't be starting the piano when you're like, is that too late already was my five-year-old thinking. So <laughs> pretty focused little five-year-old. Um, but yeah, so I started having lessons when I was six, but I was, I've been incredibly fortunate with the teachers that I've had. My first teacher, Miss Francis, um, people from Palmerston North will remember who I'm talking about. Mavis Francis was a very important um, figure in the uh, music teaching community in Palmerston North. She was completely relaxed with me showing up and saying, I don't like the way Beethoven finished this sonatina, so I've rewritten it. And she was like, <laughs> great, let's see it. And so that was fine. And she never tried to negotiate with me going, well, you know, you can do it your way, but really you have to do it Beethoven's way. There was none of that. It was just like, oh, good, that's good for you. If you didn't like it, you've redone it, good for you. And I think that just openness to the, yes, this is just what we do matched very nicely with the environment that I was growing up in where you just make music all the time and you know it just was never an issue of contention that that you should make like of course you should do things that come into your imagination that's what it's all about um so I was really really lucky to have a teacher who um never tried to make me feel <clears throat> that it wasn't my job or that um that I must have an attitude problem if I was trying to rewrite Beethoven, you know, all those sorts of things that you might imagine a teacher might say like, how dare you, don't you know that Ludwig knows best? <laughs> I mean, it was just none of that. So I was really lucky in that regard. And, um, and of course I was very interested in using my skills, not just to pass exams and win competitions and that kind of thing, but I was really interested to use my skills to make music in all of the other ways in my life. So, you know, playing for people to sing or dreaming things up um, that were kind of crazy as well. You know, it was all just part of a continuum of being human. That's, that is just such an incredible beginning and how incredibly yeah. lucky you were to have a teacher like that. Because I, I know that you, like you probably have quite a personal connection with everybody who's going to be watching this <laughs> webinar. And the majority of us have a piano upbringing that's not like that at all. No. Uh, in no. fact, and mine was like, I never played a single note that I did not read until, oh. you know, I mean, that, 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 that was just me. So um, for, for teachers who are hearing this, I mean, you know, you've come to this with, you know, from the point of view of everything was okay, you're comfortable making <laughs> your own thing. But for teachers who haven't experienced that, yes. just at least they can hear you. Like, I, I feel like I just want to be like Mavis Francis. I want to be that teacher who says, oh, good, you know, that that's yeah. okay, to, to give our students permission. How incredible is it that Elisa knew at the age of six, oh, I better get cracking. Oh, this is late to start the piano. How amazing. And what a teacher to have Mavis Francis. Um, I find I found that absolutely, absolutely inspirational. Um, so, um, right, in the next part of the interview, I asked Elise to describe how she got her inspiration to write her Pepper Box and Little Peppers series. Um, and she talks about notated jazz music in general and the composer who influenced her the most, which was Christopher Norton. Your path was more is more well, you know, you've written so much educational piano music. You've you've um, you've given everybody this this gift of all these other wonderful pepper box. Look, I've got the original. Oh, look, I know that's the original. Sam's Sam's one of the OG because that's that's a version that you can't buy anymore. And um, yeah, um, and I think oh, well, that this, that's this from nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, Actually, that was published in nineteen ninety nine. That one. Yeah, I'm a bit of a, an Elisa Milne groupie. This is the more updated version. Yeah, that's the up. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But it's this this book, 
see, this pretty much changed my teaching life, my playing life, because I could open it up and I could sound like a jazz pianist. So well, look, your path towards yep, creating towards that. notated, fully notated yep. uh, stuff that no, we we didn't we don't have to make it up. It's there yep. on the stage for us. Tell us about that. Okay. Well, look, Christopher Norton, huge um, impact, not because of his music so, so much, because um, I was I was already you know um a very functional adult pianist by the time chris's stuff was being published so it wasn't a part of my musical upbringing at all um but you know but it was arriving on the scene while i was in my late teens and early 20s but i went to hear him speak about it i think it was in 1992 my somewhere in those early 90s anyway. yes it was when um, micro jazz came out he did a and, micro jazz tour and were you at the conservatorium when he did that i remember being in oh i can't remember the name of the rooms and it probably doesn't even exist anymore but um he was in a room anyway that was like a concert space and it was a big room and it was full like everybody had come to see chris norton talking about these these books that were so revolutionary and everything and um the thing that really stuck with me is him saying that he went to great lengths to put the details in and to go i'm going to put the slurs exactly the way <clears throat> that they need to be to make it work so if you are sight reading the piece and you do it accurately you're actually going to sound pretty much the way you're supposed to sound yeah. the the detail of accents and mm -hmm. details of dynamics and all the rest of it and i was just like oh that's actually really interesting because in comparison to classical notation jazz does require so much more attention to um those differences for two reasons there are two reasons for that one is if you don't know what you're doing with jazz you don't have it inside you already in terms of how to shape the phrase you're going to try and shape it like it's Haydn and you will sound ridiculous so okay. you, you know if that's your background you really need someone to actually go no 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 we need this particular note <laughs> to be louder than that one and then we need the next one to be even quieter still and then it's going to be 100% the way we want it and then yeah. you play it that way and you go oh magic it really really is and yeah. um, I'd never thought about doing that much hand holding you know what I mean like mm -hmm. you know throw the notes down I mean I wasn't writing educational music at that point and I wasn't considering it but um, that stuck with me in terms of that's smart that Chris guy he's got it he's figured that out because yes if you can make people feel successful of course they're going to want more of what you're offering because yes. what you're giving them isn't, oh, here's my glorious thought. You know, like, oh, I had this amazing idea and it's such a great idea. It's not that that you're delivering. You're saying, hey, I'm going to take you on a journey and when you travel this path, you are going to feel so good inside your skin. You're going to feel so good inside your own musicianship and you're going to get to the end of it and go, oh, that was fun, let's do it again. And that's the thing that impressed me with, with Chris's presentation that day, that he'd really thought through how to, how to make it easy for people to come into this space and to come into this world. So time passes and we get to um, maybe three or four years, three years later, it could have been four years later after I heard Chris speak. Um, I'd just finished a... Um, an education degree at the University of Sydney, which was the single most depressing experience of my life, but that's another conversation. <laughs> but getting to the end of that um, experience of seeing what people were dealing with in the New South Wales education system and seeing what was expected of students, I thought, oh my goodness, I really should write some music. Like, I there's a need. There is actually a need, and I can, um, I can meet that need. I can, I can help with this problem. So um, I could listen to Elisa all day, couldn't you? Um, and Jeremy too. They're just so articulate in everything that they do. And um, uh, I encourage you to watch the full interview because it's fascinating to hear Elisa also talk about the challenge that she gave herself to, um, to write her music and also just her fascinating take on her own abilities. Um, so, when Elisa was writing the Pepper Box series, she had a few briefs that for herself that she wanted to meet. So here she is talking about this. Very much in my mind, um, 
right from the start was this isn't actually going to work if the exam boards don't pay attention to it. So writing with one eye on what would be useful for an exam board to use as a, a piece they can use for an assessment. With one eye, I'm going to have more than th two eyes by the end of this, <laughs> with one eye on um, what are going to be great performance pieces for students to actually go, I want to show this off. Um, another perspective that I was holding in my mind was um, what are going to be really, really valuable uh, learning journeys that a teacher can take a student through in the process of engaging with this music. And another thing that was in my mind once I got going was I want to be representative of a range of different uh, pianistic techniques, of different um, grooves, meters, uh, energies. Um, I don't want someone to pick up a book of mine and go, oh, they're all very nice but I could kind of substitute one for the other and it wouldn't make that much difference. Mm. I wanted the each book to actually encompass a journey of its own as you went from piece to piece. And I wanted to try, I don't think you can ever be 100% successful with this, but I wanted to try to never publish something that wouldn't be a kind of essential. Like you, when you look at it, you go, oh, I've got to teach this. I wanted every piece to be something that for one reason or another, a teacher might look at it and go, oh my goodness, this is going to be just the perfect piece for this. So yeah. everything, it wasn't just like, oh, I wrote a nice piece. There were plenty of nice pieces I wrote that didn't make the cut. They all had to actually serve some other function that was like, gosh, when I'm looking as a piano teacher, I can't find anything that actually does that or that allows me to explore that. So it's it's got to be contributing something new or new to me. So I know that when I get my students to play from either of these books, Pepper Box 1, Pepper Box 2, that they are absolutely going on a journey. And even if they only played three or four pieces from each of these books, I know that they're going to be exposed to a variety, a variety of styles and they're going to absolutely nail this sound and it's going to be so fantastic. So we'll send you links to these, but um, I highly recommend these for students just to have an exposure to genres other than classical and not only to, to have that exposure, but to have it with such a high quality repertoire. Now, the little peppers are the ones that are kind of the precursors to pepper box, if you like. Hands up if you teach from these books. I know there's um, quite a few people who are already aware of them. Now, this, these little peppers are the things that really, the pieces that really change things for me. Um, and apparently, these, those little peppers started out as big pepper box pieces that didn't quite make the cut. Um, and Elisa decided, oh, well, I could make this Little Pepper series. Um, so they're amazing for younger pianists. Just fantastic. Little tiny contemporary vignettes. Not necessarily all jazz, but certainly all contemporary. And here's Elisa talking about them. If they're short, they give the performer an opportunity to go, huh, what else could I do with it? Whereas if as a composer you go, here's my idea, I'll say it again, I'll make a tiny tweak, I'll say it again, I'll do this other thing, I'll go over here. You know, you just iterate and iterate and iterate. By the time the student gets to the end of the piece, they're like, oh, I am rolling over those ideas. Like, yeah. I don't I don't want to have those ideas anymore. I wanted it to be, that's your introduction. Like, that's the idea. You can play a complete idea yourself. What are you going to do with it? Like, where are you going to take this idea? What? can you connect it with what can you do next and so keeping it short is part of that kind of a philosophy yes and they are they're beautiful they're gorgeous little vignettes all of them but i wanted to ask you have you ever had experience of uh either probably not with your own students but hearing any students perform any of your pieces and just thinking yeah they haven't listened to enough jazz this is not working no I can honestly say I've never had that experience. I've never had that experience. I've sometimes heard a student play my piece and I've thought the teacher hasn't heard enough jazz. Right. So the teacher is not I've thought the teacher, it well enough or the teacher thinks yeah, I think the teacher thinks it's something else. But you see a lot of the little peppers pieces aren't necessarily 
jazz. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, they're, they're contemporary. They could be jazz, like the kind of standards in waiting, if you yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. if you took it and then played it with a jazz trio or a jazz yeah. ensemble, it would be awesome. It yeah. would be like yeah. something yeah. that I'd love to organize or have organized for me, <laughs> but like organize is probably more realistic, you know, sometime in the next 25 years is, um, you know, some performances with, is, you know, ensembles that work together all the time where they take one of the Little Peppers pieces and they use it as a jazz standard to create, you know, yeah. a jazz performance. I would be really fascinated to see that that, really. how that would work because there's a lot in the little, you know, the, the, the ideas in those little peppers is um, quite, um, there's just a lot in a small amount. They're just uh -huh. little seeds of stuff that could be, you know, sprouted forth. So Elisa wants us to be inspired to change her pieces. How wonderful is that? And this is something that I have only embraced recently since writing my Rote Repertoire series. Because for those of you who are familiar with it, you'll know that the pieces are always written in three levels. The first level is taught by rote and then their score reading for the next two levels. But then I always say to my students, okay, well, now that you've played levels one, two, and three, why don't you go and make up level four? And so the level four of Chameleon would be the jazzy version and the jazzy version in a different key, the jazzy version in a different key and a different octave, something like that. Um, and so my students are really used to doing a level four but now they will say, they will play a, a Little Peppers piece and then they'll say to me, oh, I'm going to make up a level four of that piece. And their terminology for making up their own version of anything is to call it a level four, which has been quite gorgeous. But isn't it wonderful that that is what Elisa is really setting out to do with her Little Peppers, to give them an idea and in some sort of inspiration and she wants them to run with it. So now I'm going to play you the best and final part of my interview with Elisa. Uh, I asked her what would be her biggest tip. I asked her the same question that I asked Jeremy. What's the biggest tip for teachers who want to bring jazz into their comfort zone? And um, she talks about a few things, but she ends with talking about the concept of just plain old mucking around. And um, so I want to play you her entire answer, which goes for about eight minutes. It's wonderful. There's some, if there's a sound that you go, I'd really like to make that sound myself, start with that sound. Because I truly believe through experience, not just, it's just a crazy belief I have, through my lived experience, I truly believe what we can imagine, we can create. And you can't execute what you can't imagine. So if you're going, I'd really like to play something that I don't even know what it is. I'll try. Guess what? Ain't going to work very well. You actually have to start with what is my intention? And if your intention is to play, I don't know. I'm just I'm now thinking through what are the possibilities? You know, there's some jazz that's kind of got that um, a chord kind of scatters out and it's almost got a kind of vibraphone kind of sound going on and kind of magical and then a little bit of double bass underneath and then the piano comes through with a couple more really lush chords if that's the kind of thing that you've got in your head going to the piano and actually going huh how would I you know how might I even start to make those sounds listen to what the sound is in your imagination and go how could I create that myself like what are the elements involved like how would I even begin to do that now that's not that's not a tip that goes, oh, and you will easily find wonderful results and live a beautiful life, all the <laughs> best to you. You know, that's not that kind of a tip. This is a tip for how to kind of abandon the classical approaches and strategies that work really well for that kind of repertoire. How to go, you know what, I'm giving myself permission to just pop them over there and take a completely different approach here because I'm wanting a different result. You know, the, the saying, keep doing the same thing, expecting yeah. a different, you know, you're wanting a different result, you need to take a different approach. So I think starting off with really listening to what's in your imagination and then thinking through, if I can imagine that, what else could I imagine that's different that I'd also be interested in doing? And how are they different? Like really just giving yourself permission to imagine 
you can actually make the sounds that you hear. You can make the sounds that come into your mind as a memory or a, an evocation of something that might have happened in the past. Or, you know, maybe it's a little bit of an advertisement that you've caught before your YouTube video came on. You know, the, yeah. it could be anything. We just go, oh my goodness, that little musical snippet's in my head. How would I play that? And just go and experiment. And it's an unbelievably powerful way forward. But it, the the problem we've got is that most most of us, and I'm I'm not one of those people because I had the fortune of my wonderful first piano teacher, Mavis Francis. But most of us have been brought up to think that that's mucking around, it's not getting on with the job, it's it's naughty. <laughs> do your work. <laughs> Don't yeah. do that, yeah. right? And yeah. so to actually go, hang on, my actual job is to muck around. <laughs> like, that's the job. Yeah. <laughs> that's really difficult. I think to get over that and go, that is my job, yes. that, would be, that would be my one tip, to understand that your job is to muck around. Yes. So, so yes, well, you've, just, you've got to muck around. You've got to be comfortable with mucking around. Yes, give yourself permission to muck around. And when kids, when students are mucking around also, we need to educate parents that that's, that's also their job. That, that is so valuable and we oh. don't want to um, yeah, shut that down. That. And you don't want to shut that down and say, oh, but what about the music on the page? Yeah, no, I think one thing that I, um, I, I don't do the, um, I don't do the, you have to spend, you know, X number of repetitions of this or this number of minutes on this piece and then your practice is done. Um, I will do that if a student is just woefully not going to meet a deadline with a performance and they won't, you know, and there's reasons why that performance is still going to happen regardless. I might do it in that context, but that's the only one. I will actually say to parents what counts is that they go to the piano. I don't care what they play. I don't care if they're doing what I tell them to do. What we do in the lesson is, you know, that's one thing. If they're doing something completely different through the week, so long as they're at the piano, yeah. that's fine. Like, I really can't begin to emphasize enough <laughs> how much I don't care if they don't do what I tell them. Like, I do not care if they don't do what I tell them, so long as they're at the piano. Because yeah. if you're at the piano, you're listening. If you're at the piano, you're noticing how your body feels. If you're at the piano, you're finding out how the geography of the keyboard interacts with your body. You know, you're doing all the work. That is the work. Yes. One piece or another piece, not really that big of a deal. You know, yeah. they can come and have a nice time with me in the lesson. And when they're ready, they'll do, you know, they'll do that. But I mean, my goodness, if every student just sat at the piano for two hours and mucked around every day, two, if they mucked around at the piano for two hours a day, oh my goodness, all of our lives, all of our, our lessons would be transformed in ways that none of us can imagine. And yeah. insisting on the do your practice first and then you can muck around or all of that kind of thing. I, I don't understand why we do it to ourselves. I don't understand. I think it's because that's what we know. Like I was never asked, I was never told to go and muck around at the piano for two hours a day. I was told to practice my scale for two hours a day. And I did it very diligently and it didn't occur to me to do anything else. And I think there are probably so many teachers in that same boat. Yeah, where I agree. They weren't agree. ever given the idea or given permission. And therefore it's not something it's easy to pass on to our own students if we've never experienced that. No, because we, we think to ourselves, I'm not being a very good teacher. If I if I don't have them doing those things, maybe I'm not a very good teacher. Maybe I'm letting them down. Maybe, you know, just maybe I'm not very good, you know? And oh my goodness, I mean, as parents also will know, like it's not just a teacher thing, it's a parent thing, to actually give the child who is in your care, whether it's a student or a parent or whatever context, to actually go, you know what, I trust that their learning will take them where they need to go. And their time, I am responsible for their time with me. And I'm not responsible for the rest of their time because they will go on their path and they will, they will find amazing things. So 
I, I can't control that. And I don't want to control that because the more I try to control that, the less likely it is that they're going to develop to the, to the greatest extent of their potential. That's a hard, that is a hard lesson for any adult, teacher, mm -hmm. parent, whatever. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's real discipline on our part you know, to go. It really is. I will let you go to, and, and then come back to me next week and we will engage again and then yes. go free. It's hard. Yes. Yes. Well, that is a brilliant place to end. Thank you so much. For My pleasure. Conversation. Oh, now you make me want to do this every week, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> How gorgeous was that? Um, I, I loved that interview and I felt completely inspired by everything that she had to say at the end there about mucking around. And uh, I know I've been guilty of that myself when I've had students who've come to a lesson and all they've done all week is mucked around. And I've been frustrated because they haven't practiced what, what I asked them to. And now my, my, my thinking is flipped on that, that really that's the valuable thing that they're doing at home. And if, the, if they're at the piano, that is, that is all we need. Um, so if we, if we were to take Eric Sati um, as an inspiration like I did before, we, could all, we can all muck around with that. Um, we can just, we all know Gymnopédie number one, for example. If you're at a piano, try this now. All Eric Sati did was have notes from D major on the top. So we could just have different notes from D major. around. Probably Sati Rojim Nobody number one. It was probably a result of mucking around. So um, now we're coming to the end of today's session. And so I just want to finish by telling you my recommended and go-to repertoire and texts um, for the world of learning jazz and notated jazz. Um, so uh, right, here we go. We've got, uh, first of all, first and foremost, the Pepper Box series. So the Little Peppers, Oh, by the way, we're going to send you links to all of these. Little Peppers and Pepper Box, I guess, Bigger Peppers. So Elisa Milne, anything by Elisa Milne, I would go to. Okay, next would be Christopher Norton's Micro Jazz series, uh, Micro Style series. These are pretty original editions here. His Latin Preludes and his Rock Preludes, wonderful for slightly more advanced pianists. Um, and now, I mean, these, these are available in micro styles and micro jazz albums. There's collections. There's also his American Popular Piano series. And I know there are all sorts of other collections. So anything Christopher Norton. Karen Bailey, another Australian composer, his Jazz and Around books. I love them. There was like six of these. Uh, so anything Karen Bailey. Um, I like Martha Mears stuff. Martha Mears jazz, jazz rags and blues. Um, so, um, and I also think people have posted things, their recommendations in the chat, which is just so useful. So everybody should scroll up and have a look and see what everybody else recommends. Martha Mears is great. And then um, here is another go-to text that I love by Susan Dees. Improvisation for classically trained pianists, how to play from chord charts. This book is fantastic it's just as good as jazz jazz piano fundamentals but for a different purpose so i would uh, we'll send you a link to that as well and then for for learning jazz yourself definitely get jazz piano fundamentals if you're more comfortable with it get playing solo jazz piano and also enroll in leela's course of how to play piano uh, in a band and by the time we've done all of that then all of us and all of our students are going to feel fantastic also if you want to enroll in Jeremy's course, there's links to do that on his website. If you're in Australia, it is a bit of a palaver to do that because you have to become an international international student and blah, blah, blah. But I promise you, it is the best form of PD ever. 
because you're able to implement everything you learn immediately with your own students. Now we all know when we attend a conference, when we attend professional development, you come out brimming with ideas, but then you go straight back to teaching life and it's very difficult to um, implement everything because there's just so many ideas. But when you're doing a weekly jazz course and you can just turn around and teach it again, it sticks in your brain. It's just fantastic. And I feel that I am now able to teach jazz because of that course. Okay, so, so that's a wrap on today's webinar. And I'd like to thank you all so much for coming, for attending live. I hope you got your bonus. And um, it was just gorgeous to see all of your smiling faces. It really makes it so much nicer for me. I loved that, thank you. So um, I hope that you enjoy Chameleon and, and Jazzy Chameleon and teach that to your students. And if you're watching the replay, thank you so much for taking the time. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and I hope you've all had fun. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day or evening and we'll see you all soon. Goodbye.